Tough Topics, Mental Health Part 2. If you weren't here last week, I do want to do a quick review just so we uh, get back into this. If you haven't been here, we are in our series called Tough Topics. And what we're doing is we're uh, just kind of looking into scripture, looking into society, looking into things that we are dealing with, uh, and kind of picking those out and saying, what does the Bible have to say about these things? What are some tools that we need so that we can leave this building, because it's really easy to be followers of Jesus in this room, but then when we go out into our jobs and our lives and our families and at the grocery store and all that, and we encounter people who are not churchy people, and we sometimes have conversations with people, what are some great tools that we can have that we can know what does Scripture say about some of these tough topics, as well as how does this apply to our lives? How, how maybe I'm struggling uh, with something. Maybe, you know, I'm going to hit one of your topics. So that's why we wanted to walk through and talk about some of these difficult things. And last week we talked, we started uh, the series, the kind of a mini series within the series on mental health. Now, before I get started, who is absolutely fixated on the grass? I mean, like, I can imagine, like, it's, it's going to be quite a distraction. I thought about bringing in a big sheet and covering it up, so then it would be like this mystery, but I wanted to kind of leave it out there. You can, you can see kind of where we're going with it. The grass is your soul and mental health, but we're going to get there at the end, so if you would track along maybe with me for a little bit, and I promise we're going to get there. So, um, so last week, when we started uh, this, this two-part kind of mini-series, last week we talked and I didn't plan it this way, but it was a little more for those who struggle with mental health, who struggle with depression, anxiety, and we're going to go through the list here in a minute. Um, but there was a lot of scripture intertwined with how we deal with some of those things. Uh, and again, I didn't plan it this way. I didn't plan to make this two weeks. It just kind of fell this way. This week is a little bit more for those of us, and I was very open, honest, and transparent last week, those of us who don't struggle with mental health, who, who don't battle with depression and anxiety, and, and I'm just kind of that, you know, thankfully that happy-go-lucky glass is always, you know, half full, or probably, it's probably, it's probably more like three-quarters full. That's kind of how I live, and that's some of you. And it's real easy for, for those people, myself included, as well as churchy people, you know what I'm talking about when I do this right here, churchy people, Right? For us to look at the subject of mental health and, and I'll say it nicely, to not have a good understanding about it, to maybe look at it with a, 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 a little bit of a wrong heart about it. So this week, that is, this, it's going to be a little bit more geared for us, for, for those types of people. Um, last week, our key verse is Isaiah 26.3, and we, uh, the more and more and more I studied this verse last week as I was getting ready, I, I just, I fell in love with this verse. This, this verse ought to be memorized by every single one of us, and it should be constantly on our mind. It says, you keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. And remember, we broke down that perfect peace, and it was like peace, we know the Hebrew word is shalom, but what did we say the Hebrew word for perfect was in this instance? Shalom. So it says, you keep him in shalom, shalom, whose mind is stayed on you. And we're like, what in the world? What do you mean? Well, that word shalom means completeness and wholeness. It's just soundness or peace. So you keep him in complete peace. You keep him in sound peace. You keep him in peace that brings wholeness. Or my favorite one, you keep him in peace, peace. I was saying to myself all week long, it would just pop in my mind, peace, 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 peace. And it was just this awesome reminder, that's the kind of peace that God wants to keep us all in. But there's a condition, there's, there's something that it says that we have to do that's not just automatic. You keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed, is fixated, is all about you. Why? Here's, here's that kind of back up and repeat it and say it again. Because he trusts in you. 
not in his wealth, not in his uh, stuff, not in his position, uh, not in anything else, not what his mama told him, but he trusts in God and God alone. And when we can learn how to do that, and guess what? Your flesh is going to pull you away from that, and it's going to be this struggle, and you're going to find perfect peace at times, and then you know your mind is going to get fixed or, or stayed on something else, and you got to get it back on God, and it's this constant struggle. Welcome to life. That's where we live, right? So the definition of mental health, as we're talking about it this week, uh, is mental health includes our emotional, psychological, and social well-being, it affects how we think, feel, and act. It also helps determine how we handle stress, relate to others, and make healthy choices. And that's directly from the CDC. And we said that, obviously, our mental health affects every single area of our lives. Every area. Our marriages, our friendships, any of our relationships, our jobs, our every single area, our sleep, Every area is affected by our mental health, and that's why it's so important for us to come here and talk about it and understand what does God want us to know about good mental health. So that's the definition. Diagnosis, we said depression, anxiety, eating disorders, bipolar disorder, PTSD, postpartum, addiction, anger, OCD, schizophrenia, and other personality disorders, disassociative disorders, sexual and gender disorders, tic disorders, and somatic symptom disorders, just to name a few. So there is a lot that is encompassing in there. There is a lot to really break down and deal with. And so the big question is, and I kind of answered it already, but why are we taking a church service? to talk about this. Why is it important for us to talk about it here? Shouldn't that be with your doctor or your counselor or your healthcare provider? And the answer to that is yes, it should be, but there is also so much in scripture of why we should be talking about this. So we started three reasons why we should be talking about mental health in a church service. Number one, it's a favorable tool of the enemy. The enemy wants to work in our minds. Now, he's not in our minds, but he wants to work and place us in situations where it just tears us apart and breaks us down. Uh, Ephesians 6, 12, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Now, this doesn't mean that all mental illness, mental illness or mental health issues are from the enemy. That this, there are absolute health issues. There are biological issues. There are chemical issues. And we're going to actually talk about some of that today. So here's, here's kind of the Christians, churchy people. We have to be very careful to not see somebody experiencing mental health issues and say, oh, that, that's a spiritual battle. Because let me, let me put it this way. You don't need the enemy to help you sin all the time, do you? Like, we can do that on our own just, just fine, can't we? Yeah. So now sometimes, does the enemy know how to get our goat? Does the enemy know how to kind of creep in and put us in situations and either tempt us and cause us to sin or uh, cause mental health issues or, or cause relational issues? Yes, but don't try to blame everything on the enemy. Don't give him that much credit. We, we do a fine enough job of getting ourselves in a lot of trouble sometimes, don't we? Yeah, well, maybe just me. None of, none of you apparently, but I do, I guess. All right, so... A lot of the things that people say, and we covered these, and, and the reason why I wanted to review through these again, because if you didn't catch last week, you need to go back, because chances are you have said, just in, in, in a room with this many people, chances are many people in this room have said some of these things. And last week we gave scripture to back them all up. Uh, you say, my life will never amount to anything. I have nothing to be thankful for. I don't know if God's even there. I'm always going to feel this way. I'm unlovable. Maybe you were told that as a kid over and over and over. Nobody loves you. You're worthless. Um, I just don't have any peace in my life. And the last one that we sanitized a lot, 
I'm better off gone. I'm better off gone. So again, last week we covered a lot of scripture that very specifically talks to those things. When those thoughts creep into your mind, we've got to learn to know some scripture to throw right at them. So three reasons why we should be talking about mental health in a church service. Number one, it's a favorable tool tool of the enemy. Number two, it's frequent in our society. And more than 50% of Americans will be diagnosed with a mental illness or disorder at some point in their lifetime. More than one out of every two people will be diagnosed, not just experienced, but diagnosed with a mental health issue in their lifetime. And according to the John Hopkins website, uh, an estimated 26% of Americans ages 18 and older about one in four adults suffers from a diagnosable mental disorder in a given year. In one given year, more than one out of every four people experience a diagnosable mental disorder. That's pretty prevalent, isn't it? It's very, very frequent in our society. So three reasons why we should be talking about it. Number one, it's a favorable tool of the enemy. Number two, it's frequent in our society. And number three, because it's found in our churches. It's found in our churches. You can look all through scripture, Elijah, King David, Jeremiah, Job, Paul. I could go on and on and on, and as you read through scripture, you can see how people just struggled with depression, struggled with anxiety, just just wanted to be gone over and over and over in scripture and you go wait a minute these are like god's chosen people like shouldn't they have you know been happy go lucky and all that that's not how it works god promises us john 16 33 in this world you will have trouble you will have things that you have to work through Paul, over and over and over, prayed, God, remove this thorn from my flesh. This, we don't know what it was, but God, just there's this thing in my life, and I, I just I can't bear it. And God said, my grace is sufficient. My grace is enough. I'm going to carry you through this thing, but I'm not going to deliver you from this thing. So it's found in our churches. Let's, let's look at a few of these examples in Scripture. Remember Elijah? Remember that really, really cool thing? We, we told this story a while back. He goes up on Mount Carmel, and he challenges the 450 prophets of Baal to, like, the showdown. And he gives them first opportunity. They build this, this big altar, and they sacrifice all these bulls, and they, they put them on there, and they call down, uh, you know, uh, fire from their gods, and nothing happens, and they jump around like crazy and yell and scream, and they cut themselves, and nothing happens. And Elijah says, okay, it's, it's my turn. Go get a bunch of pitchers of water. Dump it on this altar. Soak it so many times that it's overflowing with water. Hey, God, would you answer my prayer? Take this. Woo, fire comes down from heaven. Consumes not even this, just a sacrifice. Consumes all of the rocks, the altar, everything. And they're like, uh... Okay, his God's the real God. He captures the 450 prophets of Baal. He puts them all to death. And it's this massive victory for God. Anybody know what the very next thing in the story happens? Jezebel, King Ahab's wife, makes a threat at Elijah. Right after, says you, like, because she was a big fan of the prophets of Baal and all that, she said, You killed my prophets, I'm going to kill you. Now, I'd like to say I would be different from Elijah, I don't know. But like if you just had this massive victory and you literally called fire from heaven, I'd be like, I got this, Jezebel. You know, I could take her out, right? Watch what happened here. 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 3. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. He came to a broom bush, sat down under it, and prayed that he might, what? That he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Wow. What's your problem, dude? Like, like you just had this massive victory. But see, he let a lie, he let fear 
creep into his mind and it consumed him and overwhelmed him when he should have had all authority to say, my God will take care of you. Eventually, he did. It didn't work out too well for Jezebel, but that's another story for another day. King David, Psalm chapter 38, verse 4. Listen, listen, just listen to the angst in his words. My guilt has overwhelmed me like a burden too heavy to bear. Now, obviously, King David, he was, he was going through some stuff. And David, when he was writing this, he was like, I, I can't even take it anymore. I cannot bear this burden. My guilt is just so much, I don't even want to go on. Don't do it now, but if you go read all of Psalm 38, dude definitely needed to go see a counselor. Like, you, you read through the chapter and it's like, wow. And, 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 and this was the man after God's heart? Yes. See, because... He was expressing those things, but you know who he was expressing them to? He was expressing them to God. Saying, God, I, I am battling with this. I am fighting with this. Deliver me. Please deliver me. How about Jeremiah? What was, what was Jeremiah's nickname? Anybody know? The weeping prophet, right? I mean, that was his nickname, Jeremiah, the weeping prophet. Now, I don't know if they called him that back then. Probably not. Jeremiah chapter 20, verse 14 says, Cursed be the day I was born. May the day my mother bore me not be blessed. Wow. Think he was going through some stuff then? I think so. So it's found in our churches, it's found in Scripture. It's very common, it's a lot more common than we actually think. So why do we need to learn about this? Why do we need to talk about it in a church service? Because we have to learn how to deal with it. And as well, we have to learn how to break down stigmas about it. Again, for people who don't fully understand it. For people who haven't experienced it before. At least maybe on a grand scale. But watch this. This, this to me was astonishing. This right here, this statistic was a showstopper for me. 75%, you get that? That's like three out of four. 75% of people experiencing mental health issues, you ready for this? They go to a place of worship before seeking professional help. Wow. 75% of people, before they go seek professional help, they go to a church, they go to a synagogue, they go to a mosque, they go to some place of worship. It's not necessarily just a Christian church, but because they're searching, because they're like, maybe this God thing can help me with this because I just can't take it anymore. 75%. And we, church people, Island Community Church, we need to be ready and waiting for people who are hurting, broken, no matter what their circumstances, no matter what issue they're facing, we need to be ready and waiting for them at any given time, 75%. I say this all the time, we're a hospital, not a country club. Do we want people who are, you know, on the mountaintop? Absolutely. But we also need to be ready for the people that are in the valley low to help them walk through these issues in my life or in their lives. So I want to break this down further because, again, it's easy to try to think, well, it's just something that's going on in their life or yeah, you know, things are kind of down and out, or, you know, they've hit a rough patch in their life, or, you know what, They're, they just don't have enough faith right now. They need to pray more, or they need to, to, you know, their relationship with Jesus needs to be better. I want to try to break all that down. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit of the scientific matter here, but I, I wanted to first give you a little bit of an example. A few weeks ago, we... We're working over at the North Campus. We had a work day, 
and uh, many of you came and worked all around the property and everything before the boat show. Uh, I was one of the ones who were working in our new community room over there putting in the new flooring. And so as we were uh, making cuts and things, I was one of the people that was going outside and making a cut. And we had this big chop saw, okay? It has a 10-inch blade about this big, and it spins around about a gazillion miles an hour. And you, you know, make the cut like that. A chop saw, a compound miter saw, however you want to call it. So I had gone out. I had made a couple of cuts. No offense to the person that owns this particular chop saw there in this room. Um, I had made a couple of cuts, and I went back in, took them in, and I went out to go make another cut. And as I'm cutting, I have my hand. I'm holding the board like this, which I don't know if you're really supposed to do that, but I was doing it anyway, right? And you're coming down like this, and you have this 10-inch blade, and it's spinning all around. I'm about halfway down, and I look. And normally on those saws, there is this big plastic guard that goes around the saw, right? And it kind of, you know, it goes down with you as you chop. And you'd really have to get your hand underneath it if you wanted to cut your hand off, right? Um, I'm about halfway down, and I look, and granted, I'd already made one or two cuts. And that plastic guard was not there. And I'm like, oh, okay. If this wood binds up or goes crazy, which actually is why the guard wasn't there anymore, okay, something else had done it a previous time, okay, as I was making that cut, I realized there is a 10-inch blade spinning around that could easily take my hand off. Now, I'll get a little descriptive here. If I accidentally ran my hand across that blade and it cut my hand completely off, right? So I'm standing there. There's my hand. That's kind of weird, right? And like, you got the whole thing going on. I'm trying to not be too graphic, but I want you to remember this, okay? Right? And I'm standing there in shock because I've had some pretty kind of traumatic stuff happen. Actually, it was over at that North Campus as well. Um, but I'm standing there and I got the thing going and my hand is there. And like, I'm, I'm like, and if you walked by me and you said, oh, that's terrible. I'm going to pray for you about that. In my flesh, you know what I would probably do? I would probably take my good hand and I'd probably, no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't resort to violence. But I'd be like, um, yeah, about that. I'm all for prayer, but would it be too much to ask for you to take your belt off and make a tourniquet to stop this bleeding? Right? Because I have a medical issue. Is prayer going to help me in that? Sure. But is it? the only thing that I need in that moment? No. I need medical attention stat. I don't even know what that means, but I think it means right now, right? Okay. Stat. Let's do this. Okay. Now, I say all that, get a few laughs, but to say, this is not just a spiritual issue. This is a medical issue that needs to be dealt with. I want to take it even a little bit further, and I want to explain to you something called the cognitive triangle. Anybody ever heard of the cognitive triangle? Okay, so here's the cognitive triangle. You have thoughts, okay? A thought creeps into your mind. Maybe it's something that you were told as a kid. This could be bad, it could be good, okay? But we'll take it in the direction we're going. We'll say it's a negative thought, okay? So this thought, it comes down the side of the triangle, and it turns into what? It turns into a feeling, because it plays over and over and over in your mind, and you were told, you're stupid. Nobody likes you. Just, you should just give up. And that thought, it turned into a feeling. It, it, it hurt. It, it caused something inside of you to change. And guess what? That feeling turned into what? A behavior. And that behavior changes everything, doesn't it? But what happens when we do more of those behaviors that stemmed from that original negative thought. You know what? It stems more thoughts, doesn't it? And what happens to thoughts? Thoughts turn into feelings. And what happens to feelings? They turn into behaviors. And you see what's happening here? It's this vicious cycle. And when we have trauma, when we have an issue, when we have something negative, uh, maybe we don't even know where it came from, it starts as a thought. It turns into a feeling, and then it turns into a behavior. And so that's what a lot of people are experiencing 
when they have mental health issues or just when they're going through a very negative time in their life. So to play this out, um, I found this scenario. This is from the HudsonTherapyGroup.com. This is how the cognitive triangle plays out in our life. I just want to read you this scenario. It says, you wake up feeling tired, groggy, and insecure. You have a massive presentation today, and you hate having to speak in front of groups. Number one fear, by the way. People would rather die than speak in front of people. Okay, just saying. Your thoughts or your beliefs start up. I'm going to mess up. No one is going to like my presentation. I can't even talk in front of a group. How am I going to achieve anything? I'm worthless. I'm a loser. I should just stay home so I don't make a fool out of myself. Now, is this scenario like super out of the ordinary, or would this kind of be pretty common? This would be common, wouldn't it? These thoughts often make up the internal dialogue that we have with ourselves. Now enter feelings. After a morning filled with internal verbal assault, you're feeling even worse. You feel extremely anxious about your upcoming presentation, a.k.a. the now impending doom. Overall, you're feeling really bad about yourself, and the last thing you want to do is the presentation. Let's step back for a minute. Is it any surprise that our thoughts so directly influence our feelings? The things that we tell ourselves matter. I'm going to say that again. The things that we tell ourselves matter. Here comes the behavior. After time spent grappling back and forth and procrastination in going, you make it out the door and now you're just starting your presentation. As you begin, your thoughts are running rampant and you're feeling as anxious as ever. Even though you know your presentation subject matter very well, you can't seem to articulate your thoughts in the way you want to. You barely scrape through your presentation, stumbling on your words and failing to connect the points you worked so hard to create. In common terms, you choked up. How many times have we done this? How many times have we gotten ourselves so worked up that we can barely make it through something that is well within our capabilities? This presentation put another dent in your confidence. The event seems to justify all of those negative thoughts you had about yourself. The cycle repeats and repeats and repeats. See how that works? Something that just started up as a thought. I can't do this. I'm not good enough. Knowing full well you knew your material inside and out. But maybe that little thing from your childhood, you're not good enough, you'll never amount to anything. Maybe that popped up. Maybe an argument with a spouse or a loved one popped up and you know what, I'm, I, I, I can't do this. I can't do this. And we allow those thoughts to turn into feelings, to turn into behaviors. And it wrecked the presentation. But that wrecks our confidence. Wash, rinse, repeat. That's how mental health works. It's not just a, oh, you need to pray more thing. It's not anything like that. Our minds are hardwired to work like that. It can work good, it can work bad. So, again, another illustration here or science to show that it's not just a biblical or spiritual thing. You ever heard of neuropathways? Put your hand, let me see. Neuropathways, okay, most everybody, good, good, good. So we have these things called neurotransmitters in our brain, and this is about as deep science as I get, okay? But we build these neuropathways in our minds, and that's kind of how we transmit information. And these neuropathways are like superhighways, and they get more and more and more ingrained in our minds. Now, this, like I said, can be good or it can be bad. It can be good like mind-muscle memory, like when you do sports and you do something, you practice it over and over and over and over. Playing the piano or an instrument or, or anything, when you do it over and over, you just, you can do it in your sleep. The same thing happens with negative thoughts and feelings. And this is, 
it's, it's way more powerful than we even understand. Um, I'll give you another silly example. About uh, 26 years ago, when Nikki and I got married, I had two jobs. I worked at the Sheraton Key Largo, which is now Baker's K, and I also worked for Tower of Pizza Key Largo. I was delivering pizzas, and I'd do prep work in the back. And one of the things I had to do for the prep work was they would buy these huge rolls of Italian sausage, and they would roll it out on a big sheet pan about this big and bake it in the oven. And it was like an inch, inch and a half thick. And it was, it was kind of a little bit tough when it came out of the oven. And they didn't want to chop it up with a knife. They wanted it kind of ground up. So what we would have to do is sit in the back, put on gloves, and sit there for at least 20 minutes and kind of knead it to kind of crumble it up to make Italian sausage. And it was, it was very difficult. I mean, it was like your, your, your forearms and your hands were just exhausted. I bet you I did that hundreds of times. I worked there for like five and a half years. So skip 20 some odd years ahead. Last week, I was prepping some stuff for breakfast. I like to prep a bunch of things so I can make an easy omelet or a breakfast wrap or something in the morning. So I bought a, a little roll of Jimmy Dean sausage. I, I packed it in this circular thing. I cooked it in my air fryer, my new air fryer I got for Christmas. A little advertisement there. Um, so it cooked. It got a little, you know, browned on the top and everything. I dump out all of the extra grease, and I'm like, okay, how am I going to, I don't, I didn't want to dirty a cutting board. I didn't want to cut it in my thing there. I'm like, how do I do this? So I put it in a, a Ziploc bag, and I was like, I think I could just break this apart. Not thinking about Tower of Pizza 20-something years ago. Next thing I know, I'm doing this, and it whisked me immediately to the back of Tower of Pizza Key Largo, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times doing this. Stupid example. But you see what I'm saying? Like something can get so ingrained in our minds that 20-something years later, it's back in an instant. And again, that can be a good thing. That can be positive things. But when we let those negative things creep into our mind, those things can come back in an instant too. A hurt that you had years ago can creep right back in. Here's another one. You guys have heard of Pavlov's dogs, right? He, Pavlov did that experiment to where he would ring the bell and feed his dogs and they would start to salivate because they knew that they were going to get food. And eventually he got them, he could ring a bell and make them start salivating without any food. It's because this pattern, this neuro pathway, this thing happens in our mind and that's where we go. And if we are not feeding good, positive information and stuff in there, what's going to pop up? The negative, the bad, the hurts, the pain, the trauma, all of that will pop up. So two major paths of healing. Number one, I've said it a bunch of times, professional medical help. Nothing wrong with it. If, if you or somebody you know are experiencing mental health issues, depression, anxiety, please, please, please do not be ashamed to go seek medical professional help. That is absolutely a thing. Hopefully, scientifically, biologically, I've somewhat proved that today. But there is something that we can do spiritually for it as well. It's not going to be necessarily the end-all, cure-all. Can Jesus step in and fix anything? Absolutely. But remember, just like Paul, he allows us to go through some of those things. So sometimes, many times, oftentimes, most times, do we need both medical help and a lot of Jesus in our lives? Absolutely. So number one, prof professional medical help. And number two, you be rooted in Christ. Rooted stayed. Isaiah 26, 3, you keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Our focus must be on Jesus. Here's a couple of verses, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a what? A new creation. It could be something new. You are not what you were told before. You are not your trauma. You are not your diagnosis. You are not your illness. You are not your issue. You are a new creation. 
when you are in Christ. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Galatians 2.20, I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. It's not me anymore. It, it, Jesus, it's you. Like, like, like I, I want so much of you that it's like, it's not even me anymore. It's just my body, my flesh, my words reflecting you. That's what that means. I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And I think oftentimes people think that the Bible has a hard time with keeping up with science. You ever heard that? Like, yeah, you know, the Bible is kind of old, but science, I think it's opposite. I think science has a hard time keeping up with the Bible because the Bible's never been disproven. Has science ever been disproven? Yeah. Has science ever been altered and changed? Yep. And every single time we can look back at scripture and look at so many verses, oh, yeah, the earth is round. Uh, yep, I got a verse for that. You know, I mean, so many things like that. But I love this verse, Romans 12, 2. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed, how? By the renewing of your mind. Remember those neuropathways? Those highways that get so ingrained in our mind? How do we do it? How do we have victory? By renewing our mind. So just like last week, what do I want you to get from today? Number one, you're not alone. You are not alone in this. There are people who want to step alongside of you. ICC, we need to be that place of caring, love, acceptance, mercy, grace. That's who we are. So you are not alone. Number two, this is not your identity. You are not your diagnosis, your illness, your issue, your sin. That is not you. Are there things that we may need to do to walk through that? Absolutely. But you are not your identity, or this is not your identity. Number three, there is no shame in getting medical help. No shame whatsoever with medication. No shame in talking to a counselor. None whatsoever. Number four, your mental health is not necessarily a result or indication of your spiritual health. Again, can God help us with that? Absolutely. We're going to talk about that here in just a second, but it's not necessarily a result or indication of your spiritual health. And number five, God can and will give you the strength and tools you need for victory. He is all about that. He wants to deliver you. He wants to walk alongside of you through whatever you're going through. Maybe it's not even mental health. Maybe it's, maybe it's something else. But he wants to walk alongside of us. Why? Because he wants relationship with us. He is a God who desires relationship with every single person, no matter what. Y'all ready to get to the grass? I'm ready. So we've got a little patch of grass here, right? And like we said earlier, this, this grass, if you can't read that, it's our soul or our mental health. And the grass is, it's pretty green, right? It's, it's doing okay. Um, we've got some weeds growing in there, but that happens a lot. Nobody's perfect, right? Now, for those of you who have tried to grow grass in the Keys, is it easy? No. I, I, I tried. I have a little patch of grass, and it's just like, whatever. It's, kind of, it's more like a patch of weeds now, but it's green, okay? So keeping grass green and healthy is not necessarily easy, is it? It's a little bit of a challenge. There's some work that we have to do. And it's the same thing with our soul. It's the same thing with our mental health. We don't just stay healthy by just same old, same old, wake up tomorrow and just, you know, go do the same thing over and over. We've got to work at it. There's some things that we can do. So to keep our soul, to keep our, our mental health healthy, there's some things that we've got to put in our mind, Okay. This may look like a fertilizer spreader. This is not. This is our mind, okay? And this is our identity in Christ. And what we need to do sometimes is we need to fill our mind up 
We need to fill our mind up with the right things. Things that are pure, things that are true, things that are lovely, things that are of good report. The fact that you are loved, the fact that God cared enough about you to send his son Jesus to die for you. And so what do we need to do? We've got to take care of our grass. We've got to take care of our soul. We've got to take care of our mental health. So, it's probably going to go everywhere. Told you. We're going to, I knew that was going to happen, so I planned that. So we've got to fertilize, don't we? We've got to put identity of Christ, what he says about us. Not what the enemy wants us to believe. You're stupid. You're fat. You're ugly. You're never going to amount to anything. All of those things that we hear over and over and over in our minds. Got to get rid of that. Fill our minds up with fertilizer. Fill our minds up with what God says about us. But there's something that you have to do after you lay fertilizer, isn't it? You need water, don't you? And that's the Holy Spirit and that's God's presence in our lives. And so you've got to water that fertilizer and that grass. A lot. Now see the weeds? I'm not going around the, I'm not, I'm not going to water the weeds. But I've got to water that grass. I've got to water that fertilizer. And when those weeds pop up, what do we need to do? You got to pull them. No, 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 no. Not today. But then tomorrow comes. What do we need to do tomorrow? Got to wake up in the morning. Got to fill our mind with good stuff. Got to make a mess. <laughs> things that are pure. Things that are lovely. Things that are true. What God says about us. Got to water it though. Need the Holy Spirit. Need God's presence in our lives. Oh. More weeds. I don't want to water the weeds. I want to pull them. Guess what we have to do the next day? But sometimes there's some big weeds in there. Sometimes there's some weeds that just have deep roots. And, and we go to pull them and we just, we, we can't pull them. They won't come out. So what do we have to do? We need some weed killer, don't we? Scripture, sermons, Bible teaching, all of that. God's word, not today. Weed killer. You know what we have to do the next day? Start it all over again. We've got to continuously fill our minds with the identity of Christ. With what God says about us. Things that are pure, true, lovely, of good report, all of that. We've got to water it with God's presence in our lives. The Holy Spirit, God, I need you. I need you to walk alongside of me. We need to spray weed killer on the weeds, the ones that won't come out. God, I, 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 I this just coming on a Sunday isn't enough. I've got to dig into God's word. I've got to listen to podcasts. I've, I've got to just constantly put your word in my mind. And then you know what we have to do the next day? See where I'm going with this? Every single day. You know what's going to happen if we continue to do that? Man, we'll have some green grass. Really, really, really green grass because we've taken care of it. We've not just allowed things to happen to us, but we have taken charge and saying, not today, Satan. My identity is in Jesus Christ. Now, to be completely fair, I totally stole that example from uh, Pastor Ed Newton, great example, but hopefully you understand. We've got to continuously pour Jesus into our lives because the enemy is out to what? Kill, steal, and destroy every single bit of our lives. And if we don't work hard, work 
hard at staying pure and staying rooted in Christ, the enemy will have victory. Let's pray. God, we thank you that you have the victory. And we say it all the time, God, that we don't fight for victory. We fight from victory because you have already won. God, help us to stay rooted in you. Help us to keep our minds stayed or fixed on you. And trust in nothing else but you. God, thank you that you promised to give us perfect peace. Peace that doesn't remove all of the issues from our lives, but peace that carries us through those issues in our lives. Thank you, God, that you are a loving God, that you want to have relationship with us, that you want to walk us through. God, I just lift up those in this room this morning or watching online. God, if they've been struggling God, if they have been believing those lies of the enemy, if they have been working through depression, anxiety, or any kind of mental health issue or disorder, God, I just pray your presence in their lives right now. God, would you deliver them, heal them. God, bring them perfect peace that they have probably never seen or not seen in a long time. God, step in and do what only you can do. God, help them to not search for answers in other places, but to search for the only place that they can find an answer, in your son, Jesus. God, I pray for those this morning who do not know you as their personal Lord and Savior, who do not have a relationship with you. Right now in this moment, would they turn their eyes and their hearts to you? Would they say right now in this moment, Jesus, I need you. I want to give my life to you. I'm tired of doing life on my own. I want this relationship that Trevor keeps talking about. So God, I give you my life. Save me. Change me. If that's you this morning, heads are still bowed, eyes are closed. If that's you, you said that this morning for the first time, I would love to know. I'm not going to call you out, but I just want to rejoice and pray with you. Would you just slip your hand up and say, I got that today for the first time. Thank you. Anyone else? Today was the day I decided to give my life to Jesus. Thank you. God, thank you that you are the deliverer. Thank you that you are the comforter. No matter what we go through in life, no matter what we experience, God, we know that you want to go through it with us. What a good God. What a Savior. Thank you for the cross. Thank you that you loved us enough, if nobody else did, that you loved us enough, God, to send your son Jesus to die for us, to make that sin payment for us. Thank you, Lord. We pray for this time of offering. God, help us to be wise, good stewards. Help us to further your kingdom as much as we possibly can. God, we love you and we praise you. And we pray all of this in the awesome and powerful name of Jesus. Amen.